Hey, everyone. Welcome to our podcast, episode 26. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. We actually do our weekly podcast. We look at everything that's going on, the tech signals. We extract the signal from the noise. We're looking at everything. We're on location in Las Vegas for VMware Explorer. We're doing the pod, potting up from Las Vegas, where we are doing the cube for three days at VMware Explorer, Dave. Dave, lots of tech signals to extract this week. I mean, it's unbelievable. VMware is closing out, in my opinion, the biggest chapter in, in their company history. VMware, a tech titan, an iconic brand, closes its chapter of its storied historic run as an iconic, legendary Silicon Valley tech brand, inventing virtualization, changing the game, changing and reinventing enterprise computing. They will be on the Mount Rushmore of tech companies, in my opinion. This is going to close the chapter. As the new chapter emerges, where Broadcom is going to take over, and we predict will cut about $5 billion worth of, of fat off the company, focus the business units on 18-month business plans. Right out of the gate, it's going to be run, run, run fast, get the numbers, review the performance, and Broadcom will do what they do. Dave, they're going to do that story. And so much more. Um, Arms filing for the big NASDAQ IPO. That's going to be fun to watch. We talked about Intel last week. Maybe they could go out of business. Intel under massive pressure. NVIDIA beats huge. And that's another factor on Intel. Again, supporting our analysis last week that Intel's not only in trouble, they could go out of business. Snowflake beat a little bit. We're going to get into that. Huge story here. Do not pause this pod or leave the pod. Dave's got cutting edge analysis that nobody has, even on Wall Street. He's going to get into that. That's going to be kick ass. Palo Alto Networks beat, but they're kind of a head fake according to, to others like Dave who would think they, they're announcing on Friday and then they beat huge. So many thought it was going to be a head, head fake. So Hugging Face got financing. This in the AI world, massive funding, all the big names in there, Amazon, NVIDIA. Salesforce. Salesforce, $4 billion valuation. The AI madness continues. Dave. So many signals in this pod, and we're, we're going to go as long as we can. We're going to get kicked out of this place. They're going to pull the plug on location. We'll get it all in. The signals, big time news, news here. John, episode 26, we're halfway. <laughs> right, we're in person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, halfway of the year. Yeah, so the big news here, of course, you know, the three big vectors, Broadcom, multi-cloud, and AI. You know, John, I mean, look around, it's beautiful. Yeah. Set, they have the hub area. I mean, it's yeah. just gorgeous, the branding. Maybe the last time we see some, some something like this. This is the last chapter in the history of VMware as we know it. I mean, Broadcom is going to remake the company. I, I think VMware right now is poised to, if, if they do what their story is executing uh, to that story, they could be go to a whole nother level. Remember, VMware was supposed to go out of business when Hyper-V was a free hypervisor because their core business, the hypervisor, the virtual machines, was threatened. They turned around and invented hyperconvergence or jump on the hypergrivers wave, and boom, they got vSAN, they got killer products, and then they go to the next level, and then more stuff comes up. They got smart engineers. VMware is good, and this is the close of a chapter of an iconic Silicon Valley run. Startup, growth, takeover, drama with EMC, Joe Tucci gets a bargain for half a million billion dollars, Michael Dell gets involved. Just this VMware cash cow and growth engine has a historical run. This is the closing of a chapter. Dave. Yeah, and a new one opening. By the way, it could be another great chapter behind it, but it's not going to be the same. No, it's, it's, it's gonna, over, and it's, it's going to be a the much, new VMware is coming. It's going to be a much more focused company. I mean, as you said, you know, they were they had product led growth early on, where they were consolidating servers in the data center and saving tons and tons of money. It was actually amazing at the time. First time I ever saw virtualization in action. It was just incredible, yeah. and so that gave it a big, big boost. And then, as you said, Microsoft came out with Hyper-V and everybody said, oh, VMware's screwed because Microsoft's going to give it away for free. Well, then VMware created the software-defined data center. They went on to storage. They bought NYSERA, doing networking. And then, but then they went into the era of M&A growth. And when that happened, they took yeah. got all these assets and it basically confused the sales force. I mean, confused in the sense that, okay, you got all this stuff to sell, go sell. And that was a, a new era and they pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. You know, not all of it was, pay, was paying back. And now we're entering you know, the multi-cloud era, the Broadcom era, and it was very clear, Broadcom's yeah. going to focus the R&D on the core, vSphere, VMware Cloud Foundation, and multi-cloud, <clears throat> and you know, we'll see about AI, right? They got a lot of work to do in AI, but the future is going to be much more focused with, yeah. with, with R&D at the core. Let's talk about this next chapter. Hock Tan came, was in person. Some said he wasn't going to be here, he was here. 
and then he did the video. He didn't present, just showed a video, this pre-stage video. Um, but what's interesting is, is that, you know, and you wrote a post on SiliconANGLE, everyone should go read, VMware's future, navigating multi-cloud complexity in Geneva under Broadcom's wing, basically telegraphing what will happen to broad, with Broadcom taking over VMware. I think you nailed it. You have a graph in there that talks about the numbers. But I want to call something out on that to look at that number. VMware's a software company. Broadcom comes from a semiconductor route. Oh, you know they have Computer Associates, uh, which is going to be a big help, by the way, for the VMware integration. The fact that they got some that CA people in there, that's going to be big. But revenue per employee is something that you pointed out in that chart, and Broadcom's got great numbers. Hardware companies talk revenue per employee, not profit per employee. So I think software staffs staff differently. So yeah, but. Know, so, it, but Broadcom is more profitable than VMware. So I'm just saying, <laughs> I want to add a new metric to that. I'd be curious to see what the profit per employee, I don't know if they break that out, but, but, but it's hard. Will, can Broadcom accept the software? Because sometimes you overstaff in software, Dave. Yeah, but look, so, but, so, but, but you know, VMware. Uh, on, that's what I'm saying, just hold on for a second. Let me finish that point. More software, software looks different than hardware. Now, Broadcom, they're not dumbasses over there, they're smart. The people over there that we talk to and we interview, they're all smart. Broadcom's got great people, that's why they're so successful. What they do with VMware will be, a, will be really very interesting to see how they handle this. Okay, but so, Broadcom actually looks, their financials look more like a software company than a hardware company. You know, it looks like kind of the old Intel when Intel had the monopoly. Intel had like 65, 68, you know, 69% gross margin. That's what Broadcom's gross margins are. Now, now, VMware as a software company has you know, 80, 80, 81% gross margin. Okay, fine. But when you look at EBITDA, I mean, Broadcom's EBITDA margin is 58%. It's more profitable than Microsoft, more profitable than Oracle. VMware's really profitable at 25% EBITDA margin. But the free cash flow is insane. Broadcom has free yeah. cash flow margin. Nearly 50% of its revenue Think about this, they're a $34 billion company, nearly 50% of its revenue, 49%, goes to free cash flow. Yeah, it's amazing, and that's and, what- And, and VMware's 29%, which is really good. That's good too. <laughs> you know, so but, but, it's but, going to get better. But to your point, <laughs> they've got, the Broadcom's got 20,000 employees for $34 billion in revenue, VMware has 38,000 employees for $13 yeah. billion in revenue, so Broadcom's going to that, bring that where, into balance. That's where the math works. So you look at, that's the, that's the math equation right there. That's how you get to the five billion takeout. Uh, of, of fat. Now, fat, I use that term fat, that's, that's a pejorative term, that means like people that aren't going to contribute to the new model. When I say take out the fat, I mean they're going to cut the fat from a Broadcom standards. Broadcom's said from day one, they never changed a word. They said they're going to do it. You, you called it out on the first post, we discussed it on the podcast actually. They're going to do what they're doing and they're going to look at the numbers, they're going to get this thing as a humming machine. They're going to get this thing humming, they're going to tune the engine, they're going to get the cash flow up, they got the profit there. When they start making these changes with the fact they're going to cut a lot of billions of dollars out, they'll give a billion dollars back in R&D, a billion back to the ecosystem. So they're still up three billion on the cut, but they're going to make it efficient. And so it reminds me of that movie in the Game of Thrones, um, the scene in the Game of Thrones, that famous scene where the, the running game where they got, the, 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 the bad guy says to the brother, run to your brother, and he shoots arrows at him, he's dodging, and he, he didn't, we're all yelling at the TV, weave! <laughs> <laughs> Serpentine, Shelly! <laughs> weave! <laughs> so the run game is going on right now, and what's going to happen with Broadcom is going to say, look it, we're going to cut all the fat, you guys got a great business here, the numbers are good, you pointed that out, run and show some numbers. So build a plan, business unit leaders are going to build a plan, They'll probably kill centralized organizations, outsource that, spin out what they don't like. But the core business is good. You have the infrastructure cloud business, that's the bread and butter, crown jewels. Uh, end user computing, modern application with Tanzu. Those are awesome, and they got the edge kind of coming up, to, up as a fourth model. They're going to run, and whoever can just keep the numbers up, they're going to keep going. Broadcom yep. has no, I don't think they're going to discriminate that I don't like this project. The story's great, Dave. It's going to be who performs on the business. Uh, 100%. And then, remember, Broadcom also is going to have to delever. Just like it's done with all of its other acquisitions, it will identify opportunities where there's value to create cash. I, you know, I have said that Carbon Black could be one of those assets. I mean, they could, they could get probably several billion dollars for Carbon Black. Um, and so, I that's one that I would watch. It's interesting to me, Carbon Black, I believe, used to be under the NSX group. <laughs> it's now separate. When, yeah. When Tom Gillis went over to, to Cisco, I think they kept it separate, and I think they kept it separate for a reason to be able to track it. 
And, you know, I think, again, if it performs, great, they'll keep it if it's throwing off cash <clears throat> to, the, to the extent that Broadcom wants. But if not, that might be a candidate for delevering. But I would think anything's on the table potentially for delevering. Anything that doesn't perform in the next 18 months could very well be sold. I don't think I, I Hock Tan's going to I think it's going to suffer I think big lo losses. I think after two quarters they're going to look at the numbers, have a meeting, put on people on a plan, you get two more quarters, fix it. Get to where you need to be. Here's all the resources you need, and I think it's going to be fun. It's it's kind of the run game. Go run out and run the business, see what you got. Now, I like to call this a chapter, right? So the chapter's closed because this is important. A lot of people are uh, are saying Broadcom, we worry about Broadcom. Broadcom's a smart company. This is simply an emotional chapter turning, right? You, when, you, when you have a big change in life, you create, close that previous chapter, open up another one. So to me, it's very emotional for a lot of the staff here at VMware. Uh, I noticed that on stage with Ragu. It's half pr a prideful moment on one side and then like uncertainty of the broad coming the other. So I like to just say, look at this. Historic run as a company, Mount Rushmore of Silicon Valley, lore, now the new chapter is opening, is being written, and the future's unwritten at this point, and I don't think there's any nefarious goals from Broadcom other than get the numbers up. So I think it's going to be interesting. I don't think it's going to be as bad as everyone thinks. I think, yeah, cuts are bad, but that's going to just get the numbers in line. If the engine is going, the profit, Dave, then VMware has a great opportunity. They simplify a lot of stuff. They kind of cleaned house a little bit. They're at the, they're at the start line. You know, the, the bell gets rung and the horse is going to well, start, and, and start I think, running. And I think the other thing is, and Keith Townsend said this, I think he's absolutely right, is Hawk Tans is probably looking at it saying, I don't need to have all these people to support the customers. I want to focus the, our energies on R&D and the roadmap. Let the ecosystem support the customers. Let the consultants out there build their own businesses and, and share the wealth. He, he totally understands the value of that ecosystem. He said he's going to invest in that ecosystem. As we know from, you know, we're doing the, 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 the late night crawls. <laughs> the, the ecosystem's very excited. They're like, hey, I want a piece of that billion dollars. Yeah. And so there's huge opportunities for, for consultants out there. Final point on VMware Explorer before we move on to some of the other, the other stuff that we're going to get into is Hugging Face just announced financing. That basically continues to put an exclamation point on the fact that the AI madness can, continues. Um, big names are financing it, Amazon, Snowflake, uh, Amazon, NVIDIA, Salesforce, hundreds of millions of dollars more. It's just incredible, great, great success. It points to the confidence and the enthusiasm for AI. Here at, here at, at VMware Explorer and for VMware as a company, this whole generative AI thing is a gift um, to the industry, I think. And, and, and I, I, gotta, I gotta say, you know, there's always that expression that Pat Gelson used to have, never, never waste a crisis to make it an opportunity. Well, this isn't a crisis, this is a gift horse, Dave. AI just fell on the lap of the world and the companies that are seizing it are doing well. And the ones that understand it are doing extremely well. The ones that are mastering it quickly are going to be the winners, okay? So, and the ones that are poo-pooing it, they're going to be out of business. I'm telling you, this is important. Even Raghu, who's, who is super smart, highly respected software engineer, he's like a kid. I, I, when I remember I used to say, I wish I was 25 again, Dave. And I remember that we, when we started yeah. talking about AI. Everyone has that same vibe. It makes me feel younger. It's like a fountain of tech youth for older guys <laughs> like us and uh, experienced operating system developers or other developers. And it's for the youth, it's a, a clean sheet of paper, okay? To build new brands, new, new assets, new models, new companies. I'm telling you, AI is legit. Generative AI is going to have a huge impact. So VMware gets it. They're not AI washing, but they're being very smart about saying, we're bringing AI into everything. We're not, we're not going to AI wash. We're going to AI wash anything. We're going to just start building it into stuff. And that's what I like about VMware. Again, they're smart. You know, they might get a little bit bloated because they're a people-centric culture, but they make, they make things happen. So I, I hope Broadcom will brace that culture in this next chapter and, and make sure that AI's in there and do what, what they could do best, integrating their chips into the software. So Hawk Tan has said he doesn't, you know, the analysts will ask him about AI, how he looks at AI. He looks at it as just another workload. Okay, so he's not like something that necessarily is going to get you know, monetized directly, although it is going to provide a, a platform for more sales of the core. And I think that's, that's going to be the key. So I, I think, I don't see VMware like being an AI company per se, I see them being as infrastructure to support yeah. AI workloads. And so I think it is a rising tide that lifts yeah. all boats. And then the other big thing is their multi-cloud strategy. They are betting 
that multi-cloud is new incremental growth and Tanzu is a key part of that. And so, you know, we, you know. By the way, one thing that, we, that, we, that happened this week, just so everyone knows, that the senior executives at VMware are endorsing SuperCloud. They've said it multiple yeah. times. They're, they're not, they're not going to go out and just put it on their literature, but they are on the record, on the cube, and in the private hallway conversations and meetings. They're endorsing. They think SuperCloud's the runtime aspect, the multi-cloud. Yeah, so, and, and, and Tanzu is the, is the glue there, but you know, we're going to have to see adoption, or that may be on the chopping block. <laughs> but anyway, I know we got tight right, on let's time Let's get here. into the earnings. So, arms going public, we're not, we were, we'll talk about that next time. Let's get into the Snowflake earnings, because, um, and Palo Alto Crush, again, congratulations to Palo Alto Networks, um, but, but you have some great content analysis here. So just so everyone knows, we have a re really strong research team. We don't always tout our own horns, but we're pretty much the best at some of this stuff. And what Dave is going to deliver is, comes from the community, comes from our data, comes from the team, uh, and Snowflake, Snowflake obviously knows that too. But Dave, so present your research results from the earnings that happened yesterday, by the way. Okay, so real quick, I just want to say, quick on arm, everybody's anticipating this IPO because it's going to go out, maybe it's a $60 billion IPO, and NVIDIA was going to buy them for something like $43 billion. The reason it's, people are excited about it is because it'll hopefully open up the IPO floodgates, but the, I'm looking at the F1, and I'm not blown away, frankly. They're not growing. I mean, they're $2.7 billion last year in revenue, $2.7 billion this year, you know? So we'll see, and 58% of its revenues comes from like five or six customers, so highly concentrated. And so we'll see, and then NVIDIA, before I get to Snowflake, blew away its revenue and earnings forecast, it, it beat it by, it beat by two billion. So it was 100% growth, and it did 13.5 billion. They guided next quarter to 16 billion, which the consensus, John, was like 13 billion. So they're on fire. Here's why I bring this up. The market was down today. If, if Nvidia is blowing away earnings like that and the NASDAQ can't go up, that is a bad sign. So we could be in for more tech headwinds. Speaking of which, Snowflake announced the, the data that we have. Hold on, hold on, before you go to Snowflake, NVIDIA, what's your assessment there? Because obviously Jensen was here at the event, we saw him live on stage, uh, right here in theCUBE. What do you see okay. as, as the, the problem there? You know, two years ago, we wrote a post how NVIDIA plans to own the data center with AI. And in that post, our premise was, there is going to be a massive shift from general purpose workloads to AI workloads. And like a huge, huge percentage of the data center, like 30% is going to shift. Jensen on the call Wednesday, we wrote this two years ago, Jensen on the call Wednesday said, you're seeing it, it's in action, we're seeing the shift from general purpose computing to what he calls accelerated computing, which we called AI, okay? So that, we called that two years ago, by the way. You know what I like you don't just say, I like AI workload, <laughs> yeah. you into the cloud, you actually did research. Yeah, by the way, yes, exactly. <laughs> by the way, by the way, the, 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 the valuation of the company was around 300 billion at the time, it's about 1.3 trillion now. So hopefully some people got in, you know, based on, on that analysis. And so, but, but, but speaking of headwinds, so Snowflake announced they beat earnings, they beat consensus by maybe two and a half points. Uh, their mo operating margins were better, their free cash flow margins were better, they talked about Q4 momentum, but there's still a lot of caution, and the stock was down today, the stock was down 5% yeah. today. And, 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 I mean, and hardly a bellwether. That's not a bellwether. A bellwether would have moved the market to the other side. Well, same thing so with what's NVIDIA. Going on? What's the underlying but, but, condition? But same thing with NVIDIA. NVIDIA's a bellwether. I think we, if the market can't move, if the tech can't go up on NVIDIA's earnings. Yeah, we have to get into You this. know, when can, when can it go up? All right, now let's get so, into Snowflake. So here's the, here's the data. Snowflake that, is interesting. And this is yesterday's earnings call. No one got this. No one's even talked about it or reported it or even highlighted okay, this but, next but, but we, and it's not, not, just, not just me, it's our team. It's the whole you know, collaboration we have. So you and George were at, uh, and Streche, Rob Streche were at Databricks. Databricks. I was at Snowflake with George, Sanjeev Mohan, another part of our, our CUBE friends. And we talked to customers and they said to us at the time that they're doing a lot of their data engineering and their data prep outside of Snowflake because it's too expensive. And we're like, hmm, that's interesting. Databricks obviously crushed their announcements. And we started to dig into that and, and a couple other data points here. One is the ETR data shows that customers, and this really surprised us, when, when customers are asked, what's the number one bill that you're most concerned about in cloud? It wasn't EC2 compute, it wasn't storage. You know what it was? It was database. And we said, holy crap, I wonder if there's a lot of Snowflake customers in there because Snowflake bundles AWS costs into its revenue. Databricks doesn't. 
So Databricks appears less expensive and maybe is less expensive. So people are doing their data prep outside of Snowflake. Combine that with the new data that we have that shows there's a 38 to 39% overlap in Snowflake accounts that also have Databricks. Okay, so because of that high overlap, the large customers are, I think, doing their prep, their data prep based on the information we have outside of Snowflake and that's muting Snowflake's growth. I talked to Frank Slootman about this. He said, Dave, it's cheaper to do it inside of Snowflake because you get the whole benefit of all the governance and you don't have to go outside to do all this other stuff. But still, I think customers see it as more expensive. The other thing that we uncovered is, starting in January, AWS sales reps really started to push Databricks. Why? Because they don't get paid as much for Snowflake. Because Snowflake bundles in <laughs> EC2 and, 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 and S3. And you get the marketplace too. Right, and, and you get the marketplace. But so they're, they're saying, wow, we're going to push Databricks. Why? Yeah. Because we get paid directly for the compute and the storage. Yeah. And so those two factors combined, we think are a headwind for Snowflake and we're digging in more. We're going to yeah. do a breaking analysis tomorrow. And by the way, we're going to bring in one, one last point, two last points, we're going to bring in Google. They, Snowflake said on the call that their Microsoft relationship is getting better, but we know that Google and Snowflake are not like, like, like Amazon and Snowflake. Most of Snowflake's business is Amazon because Google wants a big query to, to go. Somebody told us, I won't say who it is, I'll tell you privately. Somebody once said, if AWS owned BigQuery, Snowflake would be a small company. So that's, that's interesting, <laughs> right? So, BigQuery is a good product. You know, so you're going to hear more about that next week at Google Next. So that's kind of new Dave. and breaking analysis that we have. Dave, that is great analysis. That is, that is being on the grid, being on the balls and strikes. It's like, as an analyst, our, our analyst firm, and keep it close, kind of like we're the, we're the umpires calling balls and strikes in the game with instant replay at <laughs> every camera angle, and they're, the other guys are playing, you know, a, a sandlot. Well, and that, that overlap on. with Databricks accounts is something that we really have to pay attention to because if there continues to be that much overlap, it's going to be very convenient for customers to do that data prep and do that data engineering and cleansing in a Spark tool chain versus doing it inside of Snowflake. So Snowflake, has to communicate to customers that the, if it's true, the TCO of doing it inside of Snowflake is actually better. Yeah. But they I, haven't made that case. I think that research you just put out is what I call the new research in analyst relations. It's, there's a new layer that's forming above the analyst relations market and just under the financial analysts. Because the financial analysts can't go the industry level um, to the depth, but they know the numbers. Mm -hmm. You're doing the num we're doing the numbers and we know the industry, we can connect those dots. This is a new area that no one's doing on, so I want to give you a, a shout out. That's the great analysis, and, you and Rob and, and, and George. And, and, the and our friends at ETR, I want to say one more thing about that. The other thing that Snowflake said on the call is that their large customers were basically consuming, remember it's a consumption model with Snowflake, they were consuming to their commit. In other words, you commit to a one year or three year deal. They weren't over consuming and so, our friends at ETR are running the data to see if there's, if that overlap is potentially even higher within large accounts, because that again, that would be a negative for Snowflake. So again, it comes back to Snowflake has to make the case that it actually it can get, deliver greater value and lower cost by doing all that data prep and data engineering inside of Snowflake. Snowflake. It has not yet convinced customers in our view. So ARM has great, great analysis. Um, Thank you. I think Snowflake, I mean, I don't think they're hurting. But, no, still but. love Snowflake. I mean, that's where they're going to bring AI to that data. That's the thing that you know, VMware doesn't have the data. Snowflake does. So they can, quote unquote, bolt on AI and succeed. Instantly. <laughs> right, yes. Instantly. Yeah. Databricks is already there in AI. Yeah. Snowflake, Jensen said, we are going to like supercharge Snowflake. Yeah, and the thing about the, um, the um, Databricks and Snowflake in particular, and Databricks, they had that lake house. They were so smart by building that lake house model because now the, the lake house data lake is the AI lake, right? AI is, that's where the AI will thrive. And the learnings that come out of the data iterations just is a flywheel and I think. Yeah, you I, were there. I mean, provide your analysis. You guys did great analysis coming out of Databricks. Well, I think there's a lot of, first of all, Snow, uh, Databricks has a lot of, they showed a lot of demos of what I would call, I won't call them vaporware, that's an old term in the old school, but they were showing er, er, early code. But it was, it was good code. It was great code because they showed what they wanted to show, that they could use the data to give the customers the, not only the enthusiasm to continue to use the, the, the data lake and the lake house, but to also get them confident 
that they could actually be successful. Okay, the, the combination of enthusiasm and confidence is the highest form of attitudinal win in marketing. And, and, and Databricks laid it out. Snowflake won that early on, yeah. but m the thing about Snowflake is, if they don't flex their structural tech product platform with the market needs, if they misfire on, say, an assumption, like data costs, moving costs or data around, that could hurt them. And, and if I'm a customer, and if the perception that I'm going to pay more, or I don't, know, I don't know what's around the corner from a cost perspective, I, if I can't see it, I don't understand it, it's easier just to be, take the nerves away and go to Databricks and do the prep there. So I buy the logic and I can see someone doing that. That's bad for Snowflake. And if they might have made it up on new logos, okay, the, the upbeat was for new logos, that's new business, I buy that too because it's a growing market. So the question is, will Snowflake be the place where everyone does their AI work? Okay, that's the question. Or is it going to be the analytical engine? That to me is what we discussed between the two events during that data week was, you had one was highly efficient on data analytics, Snowflake, operational, all that data cloud stuff that they're doing, A plus capability. Databricks is like, no, 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 we got that and we want to do more of the developer, data developer, and I think, man, it's a tough call because <laughs> it's like, you know, they're not really competing. Well, if, if, if those are the two positions, they're kind of like picking the sides of the street, I and mean, there's maybe some crossover in the middle. The overlap might have gotten bigger with AI, but it's going to be very interesting to see if that overlap with Databricks yeah. and Snowflake expands more. So, in your analysis, I, I want you to ask and see if you can find that overlap number. Uh, how big that is and where yeah, it was. We'll keep an eye on that. It is a marathon here and there is room for both, but you don't want to give a company too much of a lead. So while this is maybe tactical, the long game here for Snowflake is what they're doing with Snowpark. They announced 400 new Snowpark customers and their, their application development environment, they've got supposedly, I think the number is five or 600 applications to build apps on Snowpark, so that's a catalyst. And then things like Unistore, coming in, that's where they're bringing in transaction data to work with the analytic data. That could give a tailwind as well in future quarters. And Q4 is coming. If you're watching our pod, we're on location at VMware Explorer in Vegas. In two minutes, four minutes, they're going <laughs> to shut down the hall. A big thing's going to come to the last week. We're going to go until they pull the plug, Dave. We can Absolutely, get all, yeah. get more content to get out here. But okay. normally we're doing it at our offices remote, but we're together in person because we're in Vegas for this VMware Explorer, a phenomenal event. Again, historic event in our opinion. Uh, Nvidia stock. Palo Alto. So I was going on the earnings. Nvidia, Snowflake, check, check. NetApp beat expectations, but the stock was down. We had great sessions with NetApp here. Nvidia actually came on the cube with NetApp, okay? Then uh, Amazon was on with NetApp. NetApp is just a survivor, man. That company is, it's never, it always does well. I tell you, NetApp is just a great management company. I love that, love that company. They're like, in my mind, like VMware. They have a spot in my heart, the Silicon Valley startup. Splunk was once a Silicon Valley darling. Now they're kind of sliding away. Their stock surge on strong earnings. So they've been belt tightening. They got the new CEO. I'm speculating that Splunk is probably going to be taken over by private equity. I'm not sure. We'll see, but I'm hearing rumblings. Um, Autodesk surprise analysts with be better than expected earnings. Zoom beat earnings and hikes its full year forecast and the stock is rising as a result. Um, and they're dragging everybody back to the office, which is quite yeah. ironic. Splunk, Splunk <laughs> is a weird company right now in my mind. Don't know what's going on there. They are clearly posturing, in my opinion, from the scuttlebutt is, it's private equity bound, okay? And we know our friend Fitzy, over there, Charles Fitzgerald, Platform Mama, he hates private equity deals. He thinks it's bad for the economy, bad for tech business, um, and we'll see what happens with Splunk. Um, Arm files for an IPO. Okay. And Palo Alto Networks. So Palo Alto, so this was really interesting. Fortinet missed earnings and the stock was down like big. I mean, I want to say 20% the next day. And then Palo Alto, Nikesh Aurora announced that they're going to announce earnings on a Friday afternoon. So when the analysts saw that, they're like, oh shit, that's bad news. So the stock dropped. Well, Palo Alto blew away its earnings. Well, today's Thursday. No, this is last week. Oh, last week, okay. So I was gone to the wedding, right? This all happened, I'm watching on my phone. And I'm like, wow, how bad can this be? Well, they blew away earnings. People were shocked. And then Nikesh was like making jokes about it, like making Friday jokes. Like, ha ha, I faked all you guys out. Which, you know, again, if you announce earnings on a Friday after the close, you don't announce typically good news. Well, they did. And then the stock rocketed on, on Monday. But I tell you, tech right now, after Nvidia's earnings, if, if tech can't have a good day after those earnings, that says, that, that says to me, we're getting pretty toppy here, and so people are really, really concerned. 
Yeah. So it coming I, into the fourth quarter. I, I think the market is going to be continuing to be interesting and weird. Again, the AI hugging face got massive valuation. Um, I think I think we're in trouble, Dave. A lot of these we've been staying on the pod for a while. I've been claiming that companies going to start falling out of the sky multiple pods ago. And then since I said that, VCs have been writing these blog posts, setting the table for the fact that um, they're not going to fund their companies. They're doing the. Here we go. There it is. <laughs> it's <laughs> get out. <laughs> <laughs> we're not. We're not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. We're staying. <laughs> we're not. We're not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. Pull the plug. We're gonna go till the end. Kick us out. They're gonna have to drag us out. We can't <laughs> leave us. Um, the startup startup market is, has been um, challenged. Unless you're on the right side of history with the AI. If you're a generative AI company and you have data, you're gonna be doing extremely well. If you're a platform, um, if you're a tool that's relevant, you're gonna get funding. Other than that, startups are struggling, Dave. And and and, and it's gonna be very interesting to see what happens because there's no M and A market for soft landings or AccuHires. So um, it's a buyer's market right now from a startup going, looking for that AccuHire, hey, buy my team. And there's not enough growing SaaS companies that could actually do the AccuHire because if they are growing, they're usually AI and it's a mismatch of skills. So you, they want to get, and again, these AI companies don't need all that talent. So again, it's a very weird startup market right now. Um, there's the haves and have nots. Yeah, well, never, like Michael yeah. Dell says, I've never seen anything like it before. Like Michael Dell says, sometimes a hard rain, you know, it's nice because it cleans the streets. <laughs> so, let's see. They're, they're in my ear, John. <laughs> they, they want us out. So, are you going to buy on the ARM IPO? I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not like overly excited about it. People were asking me, you know, should we buy, a, a, you know, the open? And I would never, by the way, I don't ever think it's a good idea to buy IPOs at the open. I think you, you always get a a, a better opportunity to buy in. It's almost always the case. I, I don't, you know, to me, I mean, it's a company that's like, I love the business. I love the fact that they have a license model. They got like 98% gross margin, but it's not a growth business. And um, it's changed the industry. And uh, SoftBank's going to make, you know, it was a great trade for them. It's too bad that NVIDIA wasn't able to capture them from a U.S. competitiveness standpoint. But, um, you know, I'm not overly excited about the IPO. I love the company. I think it's great that they're going to now be in the public domain. Uh, and I, you know, I'm, we're very, very high on ARM and, and the whole ecosystem. But as far as a, a business model, I think it's, frankly, I think it's going to be overpriced if they go out at 60 billion. Yeah, uh, yeah we talked last week about Intel's prospects, ARM, you know, and Intel. That whole thing is just continuing. Well, so disruptive to Intel yeah. because it's, it's basically this license model. They don't make anything. They use TSMC. Their wafer volumes are 10x those of x86. And so they're killing it on the economics. All right, what's your rant section this week? What are you going to run? Lena Khan's not in the news, so we can't uh, no, no, my rant section is, okay, so Broadcom, they got approval from the EU competition markets, you know, uh, 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 committee. And the US FTC just chose not to comment. Instead of saying, yes, we approve, they just let the statute of limitations or whatever you call it expire. So they approve by not saying anything. <laughs> All right, so that's like just a, that's a big fuck you to, <laughs> to, to big tech. We're not even going to comment. We're just going to let you hang out and wait. And then after the deadline expires, well, I guess by default, that means we've approved it. So, yeah. I mean, that's just so rude. <laughs> it's so anti-business. What's the fine? What's the fine Broadcom would have to pay that they just do the deal? No, they, they, they've essentially been approved in the U.S. now. They just got to wait for some, a couple of APAC countries. And so I think the U.S. has essentially approved it to, because, because they didn't comment, which is just so anti-business in my opinion. They should have <laughs> approved it well in advance and let, let and signal to the rest of the world that this is a good deal. Instead, they don't. They say nothing. So, yep, my, yet my, again, FTC rant. My rant is Good. on the um, spectacle that was the Republican debate. Trump didn't show up, and so they had all up there, up there. Mike Pence was there. You watched it? How, yeah. it must have I watched so the highlights after dinner last night. It was bad. It was just, it was just comical. It was just, the, the Republicans just got to get their shit together and, like, clean house, get rid of Trump. Don't let him in. He's, he didn't show up. So, <laughs> it was bad. Oh, uh, Nikki was, Haley looked pretty good. Um, I'm getting told we got to go. John. I thought DeSantis wasn't that bad. I mean, so again, uh, Ramaswamy Ace is the uh, the the VP and a bunch of comments. It was just, it was just, a, it was just, it was a, it was just ugly. And Vivek, he's just, he, is he angling to be a VP? I don't know. Trump's VP. I don't know. That's I, you know. He's just trying to, you know, he aced the interview. He's basically interviewing for the VP job. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, Dave, episode 26, we're on location. Go to siliconangle.com, check out all the news, go to thecube.net. Um, kind of tired, day three here, we're winding down, we're gonna take a break. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pop out tonight, back home, and uh, the Bay Area, and then uh, I'll be in the office tomorrow. Oh, you got, you're taking a red eye back. Um, yep, and we're gonna do breaking analysis tomorrow. George and I are gonna do, uh, we're going to do a snowflake yeah. deep dive and a Google Next preview. You know, one thing I want to, want to, want to, they're going to boot us. They're going to boot us. I want to say one more thing before we get booted out. The hall's closing. Please make your way. You hear that? Get off the cube. You and the cube. We'll you and the cube. Get off the cube and get off. Okay, uh, before we sign off, I just want to say one thing. VMware and Ragu, who we've known for years, he wasn't the CEO before, right. Pat Gelsinger was before. Paul Moritz got it right in 2010, our first ever cube with the stack. He bought a bunch of stuff up there, Spring was one of them, he had apps up there. But he had it right, his architecture was right, it ended up playing out. Paul Moritz was a visionary, ahead of his time, great. Um, but we've known Ragu for years. The guy's smart, and, and to see him up on stage, it was a moment where the Silicon Valley chapters closed, I mentioned that earlier. It was nice to see all the, the VMware folks who have been around for a long time, the OGs, they're proud, okay? And they're proud of the company they built and they got engineering, right? So we met a bunch of the engineers in the, at the, um, the exclusive event we went to, uh, talking with some of the engineering. They got good stuff going on. VMware knows distributed computing, okay? And I think Broadcom has a plan. I've said this, people said I'm crazy, but I think Broadcom's going to integrate from the silicon because we know what Amazon's doing in the cloud. You get the silicon integration up, the silicon angle for them is integrate silicon up into the software, get VMware to be that super cloud layer, and then just enable modern apps and IoT and Edge and just kick ass. And Broadcom could pull it off, and because their ecosystem of customers, their OEMs win. And by the way, just on Raghu, that's a nice big payday for him. I don't know, 50, 60 million for a guy who really deserves it. And, uh, and, a, and, a, get more. And, a, and a good guy, maybe. That's, <laughs> that's good dough, though. All right, episode 26 is a little bit shorter than usual. We're leaving Las Vegas, baby. We're heading back. Great, Dave, great to see you. Good, yeah, good shot, you. good the crew here. Ace job, thanks for going late. Shout out to the crew. Great job, everybody.